All right, teenagers, uh, Miss Tammy's here, so y'all can be dismissed for your rise class. Everyone else, go ahead and get your Bibles out. We'll turn to the, goss, uh, the book of Acts tonight. All right. Uh, well, for the last uh, several months now, I think this is our 20th sermon uh, through the book of Acts. Uh, we've been doing this for a few months. And, uh, and so now we've come to Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10. And uh, so if you if you found that, you can stand with us. We're going to read uh, we're going to read this chapter. And uh, I'm going to try to uh, cover the whole thing tonight. And I don't think it'll take that long. And then, so we're going to look at Acts chapter uh, 10. Tonight, and uh, if you're there, say amen. amen. All right, Acts chapter 10, verse number 1. There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian band, a devout man and one that feared God with all his house, which gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. He saw in a vision evidently about the ninth hour of the day an angel of God coming into him and saying unto him, Cornelius, Aren't you glad God knows your name? Amen? Amen. And when he looked on him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? And he said unto him, Thy prayers and thine alms are come up for a memorial before God. And now send men to Joppa and call for one Simon, whose surname is Peter. He lodgeth with one Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the seaside, and he shall tell thee what thou oughtest to do. And when the angel which spake unto Cornelius was departed... He called two of his household servants and a devout soldier uh, of them that waited on him continually. And when he had declared all things unto them, he sent them to Joppa. On the morrow, as they went on their journey and drew nigh unto the city, Peter went up upon the housetop excuse me, to, to pray about the sixth hour. And he became very hungry and would have eaten, but while they made ready, he fell into a trance. And saw heaven opened, and a certain vessel descending unto unto him, as it had been a great sheet knit at the four corners, and let down to the earth. Wherein were all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth, and wild beasts, and creeping things, and fowls of the air. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill, and eat. But Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. Many of you know that the Jews had a very particular diet, and they did not eat a certain uh, a lot of things that, that were not they were ceremonially unclean for them. So he said, "Not so, Lord, for I've never eaten anything that is common or unclean." And the voice spake unto him again the second time, "What God hath cleansed, that call not thou common." And this was done thrice, and the vessel was received up again into heaven. Now while Peter doubted in himself what this vision which he had seen should mean. Behold, the men which were sent from Cornelius had made inquiry for Simon's house and stood before the gate, and called and asked whether Simon, which was surnamed Peter, were lodged there. And while Peter thought on the vision, the Spirit said unto him, Behold, three men seek thee. Arise therefore, and get thee down, and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. Then Peter went down to the men which were sent unto him from Cornelius, and said, Behold, I am he whom ye seek. What is the cause wherefore ye are come? And they said, Cornelius the centurion, a just man, and one that feareth God and of good report among all the nation of the Jews, was warned from God by an holy angel to send for thee into his house and to hear words of thee. And then called he them and lodged them in, and lodged them. And on the morrow Peter went away with them, and certain brethren from Joppa accompanied him. And the morrow after they entered into Caesarea... And Cornelius waited for them, and had called together his kinsmen and near friends. And as Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him, and fell down at his feet, and worshipped him. But Peter took him up, saying, Stand up, I myself also am a man. And as he talked with him, he went in, and found many that were come together. 
And he said unto them, Ye know how that it is an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or come unto one of another nation. But God hath showed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Therefore came I unto you without gainsaying, as soon as I was sent for. I ask therefore, what intent ye have sent for me? And Cornelius said, Four days ago I was fasting unto this hour, and at the ninth hour I prayed in my house, and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing, and said, Cornelius, thy prayer is heard, and thine alms are had in remembrance in the sight of God. Send therefore to Joppa, and call hither Simon, whose surname is Peter. He is lodged in the house of one Simon a tanner by the seaside, who when he cometh shall speak unto thee. Immediately, immediately therefore I sent to thee, and thou hast well done, for thou art come. Now therefore are we all here present before God, to hear all things that are commanded thee of God. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. But in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. The word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. There's a lot of parenthetical phrases in your Bible, and that is one of them, and that is a good one. He is Lord of all. And that word I say, ye know, which was published throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth, which the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. And we are, his, we are witnesses of all things which he did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hanged on a tree. Him God raised up the third day and showed him openly, not to all people, but unto witnesses chosen before of God, even to us who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to be the judge of quick and dead. To him give all the prophets witness that through his name whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. And while Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished. And as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then, then answered Peter, Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then prayed they him to tarry certain days. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the scripture. And Lord, I pray that you bless it. I pray that you use it tonight to, to teach us and to be our God. In Jesus' name, and the church said, Amen. You can be seated. Tonight, I want to preach to you on this thought, when God shifts gears. When God shifts gears. Uh, above that title is a small little diagram. For most people younger than me, I would have to explain what that is. That is the top of a gear shifter in a uh, manual uh, vehicle. And uh, they didn't always shift gears by themselves, but they do now, thankfully. And, uh, but that was a, uh, just a gear pattern that would go on top of a gear shifter uh, in a vehicle. But anyway, tonight I want to preach on when God shifts gears. Uh, as we read that chapter, I, I, I hope that you picked up what had happened, but, but there was a, a Gentile man, um, a centurion of the Italian band, was there praying and, and, and seeking God, and, and so God comes to Peter and and says, Peter, I, I want you to go. And, and so Peter goes, and then God saves these men, and, and Peter is shocked. And from this point on, the Bible looks very different from the rest of the Bible. Uh, from, the, from this point on, uh, the gospel will go out to every creature. It will go to uh, every part of the known world. And uh, it looks completely different from the rest of the Bible. The Old Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they all revolve around Israel. Uh, everything's about the Jews. It, uh, it's, it's, it's from Genesis 12, once God calls Abraham out of Ur, the Chaldees, it's, it's all about Israel, how they started, how they were in Egypt in bondage, how they came out of bondage, how they journeyed to the wilderness, how they finally got to the promised land, how they became a nation, uh, how they failed as a nation, how they were uh, taken captive as a nation, 
uh, the whole time they were in captivity, then how they were set free as a nation, and then how their Messiah came in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and then how they killed their Messiah. And so far, the entire Bible has been all about Israel. Uh, but from Acts chapter 10 on, the Bible is not all about Israel. Uh, the door has been opened to the Gentiles. Is anybody awake tonight? Are we, are we, awake? Are we awake? I'm not 100% sure altogether. And, uh, but in Acts chapter 10, God shifts gears and, and begins uh, preaching to the Gentiles, people that are not Jewish, and uh, that would be probably all of us tonight. And, uh, and so God shifts gears. Now, it's imperative that you know that in Acts 10, God doesn't change. You must know that. God doesn't change, He just shifts gears. He doesn't change, He just shifts gears. Uh, when, when I was a kid, my daddy sold a motorcycle to buy us, or, or buy me. I told my sisters he bought it for me. He bought me a Yamaha four-wheeler, and, uh, and that was not automatic. Uh, they got automatic four-wheelers now, but then they didn't. And, and so that four-wheeler had gears. It had five gears. And, and I learned rather quickly that to get up a hill, I needed to be in first gear, but if I wanted to reach top speed on that thing, I did not need to be in first gear. First gear w w would get you going quickly, but it would only go so fast. But if I wanted to beat the neighbor, I had to get up into fifth gear so I could blow, blow his doors off. And I could, and I won a lot of races on that thing. We had a lot of good times. But what I'm trying to show you is I think we're all familiar with how gears work. And, and first gear might get you going, but you're not going to get the, all the potential out of your Yamaha in first gear. You, you, need, to, you need to shift gears. And, and so in Acts chapter 10, that's exactly what God starts to do. God is shifting gears. Now, God does not change. I, I want you to know that. God does not change. He just simply shifts gears. And, and, and He begins to do something that the world had not seen Him do yet. Now, as we're going to say in just a moment, just because the world had not seen Him do it does not mean that was not always His plan. And, uh, uh, but this shift that takes place in Acts chapter 10, uh, it is a shift from God. And I want you to notice first tonight, it is a heavenly shift. It is a heavenly shift. Any major shift better be from God. Uh, if you're going to make a large shift in life, and sometimes we have to do that, I made a large shift when I left my home church and came to this church. But that shift was of God, and so I knew that that was the right thing to do. And, uh, and so every major shift better be of God. Now, the shift that we're looking at in Acts 10 is a shift in regards to the gospel. And so any time we try to shift in the gospel, we better have God's approval on that thing. Because there's a lot of people that make a lot of shifts about the gospel that God doesn't have anything to do with. And so we must, we must make sure that every shift, especially in regards to the gospel, we better make sure that it is a heavenly shift. I want you to notice two things under this heavenly shift. I want you to notice first, it's anticipation. It's anticipation. Just a, just a little Bible study for us tonight, and, and I hope this will be a, a blessing to you, but it's anticipation. Now, though the Jews were shocked by this, Peter was shocked, and the rest of the Jews were shocked by all of this that... It, we'll, we'll see in the next couple of chapters in Acts how people were not really sure that Gentiles could really even really be saved. And, and they were kind of shocked by that. But though they were shocked by that, that was really just God's next step of His eternal plan. He had always planned to do this. Uh, it is seen historically in the Old Testament. Historically, in Exodus chapter 12, if you'll, if you'll turn there, Exodus chapter 12, hold your place there in Acts and the book of Exodus, the second book of the Bible, chapter 12. What's happening in Exodus 12 is Israel is, they're in bondage there in Egypt and they're getting ready to, uh, to come out and, and the last plague, the, the plague of the death angel has come and, and the firstborn have died in the land and Pharaoh has finally given up and, and said you can leave and so the, uh, the, the children of Israel are leaving and I want you to look in verse number 38. Exodus chapter 12 and verse number 38. And a mixed multitude went up also with them, and flocks and herds, even very much cattle. A mixed multitude. 
So when Israel left Egypt, they did not leave by themselves. They brought, they brought other races of people with them. They brought Egyptians. Egyptians, I don't care what some professor has told you, Egyptians are not Hebrews. They are not the same race. They are of a different descendant. Egyptians are descendants of Ham. Hebrews, Jews are descendants of Shem, the other brother. And, uh, and so they're, they're not the same race. Uh, but here in Exodus 12, verse 38, it is historically seen that God let some Gentiles in on that freedom from bondage. And, and you know the way that they got out. They got out by the Passover, the blood of that land that was put on the doorpost. And, and so a mixed multitude left. So it's seen historically, but it is also seen prophetically. In the book of Isaiah, turn to chapter 49. Isaiah chapter 49. Now we're talking about the shift that God's making to open the door to Gentiles to be saved. And, and to man it was a new thing, but to God it was always the plan. He, we see it historically in Exodus, but we see it prophetically in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 49, look in verse number 6. Isaiah 49 and verse 6, And he said, It is a light thing, or is it a light thing, that thou shouldest be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved of Israel. I will also give thee for a light to the Gentiles, that thou mayest be my salvation unto the end of the earth. Prophetically, God said, You're going to be a light to the Gentiles for salvation. It was prophesied. Uh, you don't have to turn there, but Psalms chapter 22, the, uh, the greatest Old Testament prophecy about the cross of Jesus Christ. This is a, a, a verse from that chapter, verse 27. All the ends of the world shall remember and turn unto the Lord, and all the kindreds of the nations shall worship before thee. So every corner of the world will be able to come to Christ and the, the Jews will be a light to the Gentiles for salvation. So it is seen historically in Exodus. It is seen prophetically in Isaiah. But when we come to the book of Acts chapter 1, it is seen directly. It is seen directly in Acts chapter 1 and verse number 8, a very familiar verse. He said, But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you and ye shall be witnesses... And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea, so all the Jews, and in Samaria, so the half-Jews, and under the uttermost part of the earth, the non-Jews. And so three ways, historically, prophetically, and directly, God has planning, been planning to make this shift to open the door for salvation to come and to the Gentiles. And so directly there in Acts chapter 8, it's coming soon, this shift is getting ready. And uh, you can tell in a vehicle when it's getting ready to shift gears, it begins to rev its engine and it reaches a max uh, limit of RPMs and it's time to shift. Acts chapter 1, it's getting time to shift gears and, and he's about to send the gospel to the uttermost part of the earth and in Samaria and Judea and in Jerusalem, all over the place. And this shift that God makes in Acts 10, though it was a shock to man, was always God's plan. Now, being 2,000 plus years removed from this, it may not seem a big deal, but it ought to be a big deal that God had always planned to preach to us Gentiles. Now, God's eternal plan in Acts 10 was coming to pass. And the problem we're going to see with Peter is that we don't always know what God's been thinking. See, when God tries to do something, and we're thinking, whoa, 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 you're messing up my plan here. But so we don't know what God's plan's always been. See, God's plan from Exodus and Isaiah, Psalms, and, and Acts has always been to go to the Gentiles. His plan has always been to go to the whole world. That was always been His plan. But the problem with Peter was he didn't know what God had been thinking for eternity past. And, and so for some of us, sometimes God tries to involve Himself, make a shift, and maybe shake things up some and, and, and change a little bit of a couple of things. But we don't always know what God's been thinking about. And so sometimes we, sometimes we hesitate or sometimes we resist it. And, uh, but this was God's eternal plan that was coming to pass in Acts chapter 10. So it was an in, it's anticipation. But would you notice, secondly, here in Acts 10, it's attraction. It's attraction. In Acts 10, as this angel from God comes to Cornelius... 
He says in uh, verse number 4, When he looked on him, he, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? And he said unto him, By prayers and thine alms are come up for a what? A memorial. Acts 10 and verse 4. Thy prayers and thine alms are come up for a what? A memorial before God. His prayers had established or built a memorial to God. A memorial is an attraction. It is something that we can see. It is something attractive. It is something to go look at. And in Cornelius' prayer, there was something attractive to God. It had, it had reared up a memorial in heaven before God, and his prayers had built a memorial. Now, this is not the message tonight, but I will, uh, I'd be remiss not to mention it. But I wonder if you have a memorial in heaven. I wonder if your prayers, if you've prayed enough to establish a memorial in heaven before God. Cornelius had prayed, and he had prayed so strongly and so honestly, it had, it had developed something attractive in it, and there was something attractive in his prayer, attractive to God. Now, we could pray beautifully and and, and, and put some nice religious lines together and pray to what man would think would be an attractive prayer. But Cornelius' prayer was not attractive to man. It was attractive to God. There was something in his prayer that attracted God to him. Now, I do want to ask if there's anything in your prayer that you would believe that attracts God to you. I think Cornelius stands as a great lesson as a prayer warrior, a man who doesn't even yet really know God. How about that? Being a, being a great prayer. And, uh, but anyway, his prayer had developed a memorial in heaven. Something was attractive in his prayer from God. And you say, well, what could that have been? Well, in Acts 8, a familiar story, there's a man, he's an Ethiopian eunuch. And, uh, and God sends Philip, the evangelist, to go and, and speak to him. And, and the Ethiopian eunuch gets saved. And then in Acts chapter 9, you've got a, a Pharisee of Pharisees named Saul of Tarsus. And, and Jesus Christ himself comes and, to meet him. And, and Saul of Tarsus, a Hebrew, gets saved. And so then in Acts chapter 10, we've got a man named Cornelius, who is a Gentile uh, of the Italian band, and a Gentile, and then he gets saved. And so in Acts 8, you've got a son of Ham getting saved. And in Acts 9, you've got a son of Shem getting saved. And then in Acts 10, you've got a son of Japheth getting saved. Shem, Ham, and Japheth. All uh, three races of mankind right there in three consecutive chapters getting saved. And what a blessing that is. And I believe we can see God's uh, heart to win the world in those three chapters. Now, there were all three different. The Ethiopian eunuchs, the son of Ham. And then we got Saul of Tarsus, the son of Shem. And then we've got Cornelius, the son of Japheth. All three different races, but they all were... Th- had one thing the same. Though they were all different, they all had one thing in common was they all wanted God. You see, when Philip went and found this Ethiopian eunuch, he was reading the book of Isaiah trying to find Jesus in there. He's looking for a Savior. He's looking, he's looking for truth. He's looking for salvation. In Acts chapter 9, Jesus himself comes to Saul of Tarsus and said, It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. I've been dealing with you. And Saul of Tarsus honestly thought he was doing right by everything that he did. He was looking for God. He was trying to be the best believer that he could. He had just been misled, but, but he wanted the truth. He wanted God. And then in Acts chapter 10, we find a man named Cornelius who was devoutly praying. He even says later that he was fasting, trying to find God. Well, they, they were all three polarly different, but they all three wanted the same thing. They wanted God, and God is attracted to people who want God. God is attracted to hearts and minds that want God more of Him. He is attracted to men who want to know the truth. He is attracted to women who want to know the truth. And so in Acts chapter 10, as he prays and sets up this memorial, this this attraction, God was attracted to the Gentiles because they wanted Him. Now, God opening the door of salvation to the Gentiles, opening the gospel door to the Gentiles, was not Him being a bully to the Jews because they didn't want Him. They didn't want Christ. They did not want Jesus. They didn't want Him. 
He was not being a bully to them. They had rejected him. They had killed the Messiah, um, and they had rejected him. The, the Gentiles wanted him. And I think in Acts 8, Acts 9, and Acts 10, you see a principle that all three different individuals, whether, whether no matter what race you are in, God will save the one that wants to be saved. And so the attraction in this heavenly shift, they, God was wanted. Uh, so it was a heavenly shift. But would you notice number two in Acts 10, it was a hesitated shift. A hesitated shift. Peter was very slow to embrace the shift. And if we're not careful, we will hold God to our own preconceived ideas, ideals, and methods. And that Peter was a little slow to accept it. As this sheet came down from heaven with all manner of... Uh, with all manner of beasts on it, four-footed beasts and wild beasts and creeping things and fowls of the air, this, this sheet came down and, and a voice came from heaven, Rise, Peter, kill and eat, verse number 14. But Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice spake unto him again the second time, What God hath cleansed, thou call not, that call not thou common. This was done thrice, and the vessel was received up again into heaven. And so Peter was a little slow to, uh, to jump on board with this eating of unclean animals, and which represented the Gentiles. He was a little slow to embrace it, but I want you to notice, I want you to notice its allowance. Its allowance, this hesitation that Peter had. Uh, uh, to go and do this new thing, to eat this unclean meat that he had never eaten before. He was slow to, to do that. And I want you to know that God allowed that hesitation. God allowed his hesitation. God repeated that same vision three times for him. Three times. David said in Psalms, I think it's chapter 8, that God knoweth our frame and that we are but dust. You see, God knows you don't know what he's been thinking about. God knows you don't understand. God knows your mind's not infinite. God knows you don't see the end, end from the beginning like He does. And so as Peter was hesitant to, uh, uh, to, to, just, to completely change everything he had ever been taught, to completely change everything he had ever believed, to completely change everything he had ever eaten in his life, he was hesitant and God was patient. God allowed that hesitation. He was patient with his hesitation. And I, and I want you to notice something about what, how God interacts with Peter in this shift. God is patient with our hesitation, but He is not passive. He is not passive. Meaning, uh, Peter was hesitant, but God didn't just say, well, Peter's hesitant and he don't really feel like he should do this, so I'll, I'll just let him stay the same. I'll let him go on. Look in verse 19. If you're still awake, say Amen. Verse 19, while Peter thought on the vision, the Spirit said unto him, Behold, three men seek thee, arise therefore, and get thee down, and go with them. Say the next two words, doubting nothing, doubting nothing. And so God was hesitant, or God was uh, patient with Peter's hesitation, but it wasn't passive. He said, you know, it's taking you uh, some time to let that sink in, and, and I know it's a completely different mindset. It's a completely new doctrine. It is a completely new philosophy. It is a completely new mentality. I know it's taking you some time, uh, but don't doubt me. Just do what I say. <laughs> Basically is what he said. Go and, and doubt nothing. Just, just go with it and just do what I said. And so God is okay with us being hesitant, but he is not okay with our being rebellious. Because had Peter said, no, God, I'm not doing that. I'm not going to the Gentile. I'm not going to Cornelius' house. I'm, I'm not going to go and let them hear the gospel. I'm not going to do that because it's never been done before. That would go way beyond being hesitant to being rebellious. And God's okay with being hesitant, but He's not okay with being rebellious. And so notice that God allowed him to be hesitant. And, uh, and so a little principle that we can see in that as God interacts with Peter is sometimes we should allow others to be hesitant also. Because everyone doesn't know what we've been thinking. Right? 
Everyone doesn't know what, what we've been thinking. You know, your husband's been gone all day and, when he, and you've been stewing on something. And as soon as he walks in the door, you drop it on him. And then he doesn't respond maybe just right. And you're like, what's wrong with you? This is, a, this is, you know, this is obviously the right thing to do. Well, he ain't been thinking about it all day. And he doesn't know that you've been thinking about it all day. And so we should allow each other to be hesitant a little bit. Especially when it's something completely contrary to how we've always thought. So we should, we, should, we should allow some hesitation. We should allow some hesitation. Uh, same thing with us men. Sometimes we're not very patient. Um, at least I'm not very patient. Uh, every now and then, so, you know, just once or twice a year, I might lose patience. But uh, we have to allow others to be hesitant uh, because they don't know what we've been thinking about. So anyway, it's allowance. But notice, notice secondly, it's acceptance. It's acceptance. Peter was hesitant at first because God didn't just come straight out and say, Peter, go preach the gospel to Gentiles. You know what he did? He used a food illustration because Peter must have been a Baptist. (laughs) And food illustrations were the quickest way to his heart. And the quickest way to his mind was to use something to do with food. And so God uses a food illustration and uh, it, it, it is an allegory. It is something that, you know, it, it's food, but it, I'm, it's, really, it's really people. You know, it's four-footed beasts, but it's really people. It's, it's wild beasts, but it's really people. It's, it's fowls of the air. It's creeping things, but it's really souls, souls of a different race than yours. And, and, and so God was a little bit patient with him, but, and Peter was hesitant. But then Peter finally accepts it, and, and finally Peter, Peter gets it. it this shift, uh, that gear catches in his heart, and he realizes what God uh, is doing. Would you look in verse number 34? He gets there to Cornelius' house. They recount to him, he said, why, not, why did you, why did you uh, send for me? How did you know I was there? And they said, well, quite frankly, God told us where you were, and God told us to go get you, and you would tell us everything that we need to hear. And verse 34, Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. Boy, wouldn't it be great if we all knew that really well? Wouldn't it be great if everyone in the world understood that God is no respecter of person? That God does not look at one race better than He looks at another race. God does not favor one country over another. Unless you're talking about Israel, God still does favor Israel or His chosen people. And everything will eventually come back to that. But that's, for another, that's another lesson for another day. But when it comes to the matter of salvation, God does not prefer white people over black people or white people over Mexican people or white people over Asian people or Asian people over Mexican people or any, any combination of those things. God is no respecter of persons. And Peter said, of a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. And Peter says, aha, I get it. The light bulb has turned on above his head, and he finally gets what God is doing. God is trying to give salvation to Gentiles. And it finally clicks with Peter, and when it clicked, he accepted it. This is his aha moment. This is the moment when the gear caught with him, and he realized what God was up to. Later on, Peter uh, will uh, Peter will will defend this, and and he will say make the statement. You know, I cannot withstand God. If God wants to save these Gentiles, I'm not going to stand in His way because some Jews were upset by that. Uh, but but Peter defends it. He says, I'm not going to stand in God's way. And if God wants to save these people, then God's going to save those people. And and he accepted the shift. He accepted the shift. So it was a heavenly shift. It was a hesitated shift. But I want you to notice in verse number 28 that it was a healing shift. It was a healing shift. Peter goes to Joppa, and he goes with these men, and he gets into uh, Cornelius' house. And in verse number 25, we'll pick up there. As Peter was coming, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter took him up, saying, Stand up, I myself also am a man. Because we don't worship each other. 
We don't, we don't worship a particular pastor, a particular preacher. And now we may respect them and we may uh, we'll give honor to whom honor is due. I think the Bible says double honor, but it never says worship. It never says worship. And sometimes we are guilty of putting a man and lifting him far outside the bounds of Scripture. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. I don't know, this was not planned, but... 1 Corinthians chapter 3, we don't worship man. We may be, we may be indebted to men for uh, what they've done. In 1 Corinthians, I'm sorry, chapter 4. In verse 6, if you're there, say amen. And these things, brethren, I have in a figure transferred to myself and to Apollos for your sakes, that ye might learn in us not to think of men above that which is written. Not to think of men above that which is written, that not one of you be puffed up for one against another. He says, not to think of man more than that which is written. What's been written? Honor, double honor, and that's the line. That's the limit. Double honor is the line. We don't fall down and worship a man. We don't kiss anyone's ring. We do not worship their garments. Honor is the line. And so when we take a man and put him outside of put him above honor, we've crossed that which was written. We've crossed the word of God and we've crossed the line. And so we don't worship each other. Now I'll turn it back to Acts 10. We'll uh we'll we'll move on. I know y'all loved that point, didn't you? And so verse 27, and as he talked with him, he went in and found many that were come together. So he, he finds a congregation, uh, uh, probably bigger than this one tonight. He finds a congregation. And he said unto them, ye know, look in verse 28, look, this is key. Ye know how that it is an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or come into one of another nation. But God hath showed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Basically, Peter walks into the room, being the only Hebrew, so he's, he's Hebrew, he's you know olive, olive skin, and he walks into a room full of white people, and he says, you know that it's not even legal for me to be in here with you. I'm not even supposed to be in the same room. You remember in John chapter 4, Jesus, who was Hebrew, which means he had an olive skin complexion, he wasn't white like the paintings, he was Hebrew. He was not a son of Japheth, he was a son of Shem. And so Jesus was in Samaria, and he stopped at a well, spoke to that woman, and she said, why are you speaking to me, seeing you're a Jew? We're not even supposed to be talking together. We're not even, you know, we're not even supposed to be speaking to each other. Because the Jews, now you won't find that in the Old Testament, but the Jews had created this law that we shouldn't even go, we're not even going to go into the same buildings. We're not even going to go into a, a, a house owned by a Gentile. Uh, if you remember in the crucifixion uh, the night before when they had him on trial, that the Jews, they had to take him to Pilate, who was a Gentile. Uh, he worked for Rome. And, and, but they wouldn't even go inside the building. They said they took him and they said, y'all take Jesus inside and y'all condemn him to death and come back outside and tell us. They wouldn't even go in there because they didn't want to be defiled. And so how hypocritical. Uh, but they had added this thing about it's not even, law, not even legal to talk to him, not to speak to him. And, and so... Peter gets to Cornelius' house and he says, You know how it's not lawful for me, I'm a Jew, to come into or keep company with one of another nation. Then he says this, But God has showed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. The vision, the four-footed beast, the wild beast, the creeping thing, the fowls of the air, rise, Peter, kill, and eat, it clicked. And he realized, "Mm, God said not to call common what he's cleansed. God sent me to these people. God wants to save these people. God said they're not common, they're not unclean. And a bridge was built. A bridge was built that had never existed before. A bridge was built from Jew to the rest of the world. And it had never existed. It was not existed. It was not existed in the Old Testament. And finally, a bridge was built and a division was healed. And uh, we see its amendment. We see the amendment. We've got races of people that now can come together in the name of Christ, where before that was not even possible in their minds. The friend of publicans and sinners has left his mark on this world, 
and racial unity is that mark. The mark of Christ is racial unity. And I got hardly nothing on that. Let's say that again. The mark of Christ was racial unity. You want me to prove it? Galatians chapter 3 and verse 28. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. It's amendment. The gospel of Christ took nations that hated each other and built a bridge and put them together. And they found unity in the gospel. It was a healing shift. It's amendment. But I want you to notice, lastly, it's authority. It's authority. Would you look in verse 36? This is important for you to know because going forward, you need to know that God died for the sins of the whole world. That means every creature. That means red, yellow, black, or white. They're all precious in His sight. When I worked on a bus in Arkansas, we used to change it, red, yellow, black, and white, put them together, watch them fight. <laughs> but it doesn't matter what race someone is, Jesus died for their soul. And it is important that every believer know that. That is a foundational doctrine. There is neither bond nor free, male nor female, neither Jew nor Greek. We are all one in Christ Jesus. You're not better than any other saved person because of what nationality you are, what language you speak, what color your skin. No one is more important to Christ based on race. And that is important that we all know that. That is a doctrinal, that is a doctrinal foundational truth you and I must know in our hearts. It must not be something we just nod to when the preacher says it and say, yeah, yeah, not, yeah, yeah. No, it needs to be something you know and feel and believe, part of your identity. Going forward, Calvary Baptist Church must have that as part of its identity. Not something we nod at because it's in the Bible. Something that we are identifiable by. Amen. It's amendment. It's amendment. And I understand the last decade has been the worst, some of the worst years for racism in the last 50 years, 40 years, at least in my lifetime. And if there's anywhere racism shouldn't exist, it ought to be the house of God. It ought to be the house of God. It's amendment, but I want you to notice it's authority. It's authority. You say, well, how in the world do we conquer that? Verse 36. The word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ, He is Lord of all. That word, I say, ye know which was published throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all things which he did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hang on a tree. Him God raised up the third day and showed him openly. And he begins to preach to them the gospel. But he said, He is Lord of all. He is Lord of all. Now, he's preaching that to Gentiles. Now, hold your place right there. Turn to Acts 2. Last scripture. Acts 2. Just back a few pages. Look at verse 36. This is a message to Jews, to, the, to Israel, on the day of Pentecost. Verse 36, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly, that God hath made that same Jesus, whom ye crucified, both Lord and Christ. And so in Acts chapter 2, Israel had to accept Jesus Christ is our Lord. He is our Lord. He is our Messiah. Jesus Christ is God. That is something Israel as a nation was supposed to accept. But in Acts chapter 10, it's not Israel accepting that. It's the Gentiles accepting that. Because Jesus 
is not just the God of the Gentiles. He is not just the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. But Jesus Christ is Lord of all. All races must bow to Jesus Christ. Every tongue, no matter which side of the world it's from, will have to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. It is not just a Jew thing. And Peter was realizing that, that Jesus is not just the, 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 God of, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. He's not just the God of our forefathers, but He is Lord of all. And these Gentiles, they must accept Jesus Christ just like Israel had to accept Jesus Christ. It's authority, the authority in this shift. Jesus is Lord of all. You know what that means? That means He's the Lord of the Jews. He's the Lord of the white people. He's the Lord of the Mexican man. He's the Lord of the black man and the Asian man. Jesus Christ is Lord of all. Therefore, all must be saved by Him. All of them. A shift takes place in Acts 10. And the world has been riding in that gear ever since. God has not shifted gears since Acts chapter 10. That transmission has been in the same gear for over 2,000 years. Red, yellow, black, and white, all are precious in His sight. It was a heavenly shift, a hesitated shift, but it was a healing shift. And there is only salvation in Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter what race someone comes from, there's only healing in Jesus Christ when God shifts gears. I am thankful that God shifted gears. I was not, I am not a Jew nor the son of a Jew. And I'm thankful that God shifted gears. Everyone in this room should be thankful. Amen. Let's all stand on our feet. When God